Now, so I'll be talking in a sense uh, how the how we could uh, work that we are doing right now on supporting the Philippine government on how to maximize and not just the Philippine government, page I see, uh, including Department of Health, page I see, and other government uh, agencies involved in UHC on how to maximize financing opportunities. Now, one of the things we have to understand is that the UHC universal health care in the Philippines is not just a task of the Department of Health, but it's actually the task of everyone, including PIDS. Uh, so, uh, le le next slide, please. And the Asian Development Bank, of course, uh, have been supporting universal health care uh, late last year, around November, we approved a policy loan, a program loan of about $600 million, which supports, which is uh, supporting policy reforms and actions uh, on universal health coverage, on universal health care. We have coupled that with the technical assistance uh, and of at least $2 million for mobilizing more money. And we are now very much engaged in working in providing the evidence, providing the research, providing uh, helping the Department of Health, PHIC, and other government agencies uh, move forward the UHC agenda. Now, we are working on a lot. The, the support, the work, our engagement in government is across uh, from financing to regulatory to service delivery. But I will focus the discussion more on your, uh, on financing. And since one of the things that we should, uh, one of the things that we should sort of reflect uh, which is a little, when you start talking about UHC, it's not, it did not happen overnight, right? It, you know, health for all has always been a global agenda. Uh, probably even way back after World War II, people were talking about uh, health for all. But the one thing that probably makes UHC a little different is that uh, now it explicitly talks about money. Because I think part of the problem with the discussion on health for all, was that it talks about, okay, all these services should be provided, then it assumes that the financing will follow. So what we now have with the UHC discussions and, and, and with the UHC law of the Philippines is that there's actually an uh, explicit call for ensuring uh, in the Section 2 of the law that this access to care will be without financial hardship. It will focus on the vulnerable, so uh, that's to be. And uh, if you move into the next slide, please. And if you move into the general objectives, it again reiterates this point that it should be a, that there should be protection of financial risk. So in a sense, when you start talking about UAC in the Philippines, can we have the next slide, please? Uh, so it's yes, uh, uh, globally, this uh, the way UAC is now described in the Philippine laws. Uh, Republic Act 11223, I really like that number, is that it's consistent also of how the Sustainable Development Goals have framed UHC, uh, so as SDG 3.8. So what, there's really, when you talk about UHC, it's really about financial protection, among others. It, it includes financial ensuring in financial protection, particularly for the vulnerable population where they access healthcare. It implies that there should be solidarity in health financing because you could not have financial protection in a system where there is no solidarity in health financing, where your system is essentially financed by either uh, out-of-pocket payments by the population or voluntary health insurance schemes. Because with those systems, there is really no uh, social solidarity. Uh, so in a sense, it's really looking for increased health financing uh, but in but in a manner sustaining the solidarity. And so we're really talking more money into health, into UHC, to the contributory schemes. So we talk uh, or tax revenues. So con contributory schemes would be the premium contributions. Uh, some call it a payroll tax or getting tax revenues and other revenues. So that uh, which is, has always been considered more uh, with more solidarity than user fees as the way in which you pay for health. So next slide, please. So what are how are we financing health debt? So let's 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 reflect back a bit. And and thanks to the Philippine Statistics Authority, the Philippines have quite an updated uh, picture on how health is being financed in the Philippines. In uh, 
Next slide, please. So the, uh, so the latest they have, and we call this is national health accounts, of course, those of you who are familiar with the work on the national health accounts. Uh, and I do recall that before the lag was about four years or five years. Now, this report actually came out in 2021. So we're actually seeing less than a year lag, and it's great because it actually gives sort of real-time uh, data, real-time uh, evaluation, or nearly real-time evaluation for those who are uh, pushing uh, imp or implementing the UHC agenda. So what did we do? Well, a bit of good news for 2020. So uh, well, overall, uh, we've actually seen uh, our spending for health increase, fastest increase since 2014, as the way the PSA said it, about 12.6%. Uh, we usually look into current health expenditure, okay? And when we start breaking down uh, the sources of financing that you usually use current health expenditure, uh, but it's it's quite you know it's quite good it's quite we should also note that uh, when UAC needs more capital investments and there's actually a drop in 2020 probably partly bought by COVID but let's focus on the CHE story and so what does what did what is it showing so in 2020 there's actually a dramatic uh, quite significant probably even dramatic increase in the share of gov of uh, in the in, the, in of in government spending absolute numbers in absolute amount. So if you look at the green, so we've been seeing increases from 10 to 18% uh, from 2016. In 2020, we saw an increase of 28% of government spending. So it can be attributed to the spending brought, brought about by uh, the country's response to COVID-19. But it actually, in a sense, gives uh, UHC advocates a higher floor in which to advocate more money for health. You know, so part of the challenge that they have to do now is to make sure that this increased spending that not government it has provided for health should not go down. Uh, and, and really, this becomes sort of the new base in which they should ask more money for 2021. We don't have the 2021 numbers, but I expect the numbers also to have increased in 2021. What's more interesting is if you look at the out-of-packet spending. So out-of-packet spending, the increase per year, the last four years, has actually been going down uh, from, uh, sorry, uh, for about 7% increase to 6%. And in 2020, the increase was quite low, 3.6%. 3 so there seems to be some, it seems to work because uh, one, would, one would say, look, when you increase government spending, which or the compulsory, this is the government plus the uh, compulsory contributions of PHIC, uh, it's not automatic that you will see a drop in out-of-packet spending, particularly in a middle-income country like the Philippines, because... Uh, as you become more middle income, more people become more well off. They actually would look for more health services and pay for it out of pocket as luxury goods. But it doesn't seem to be happening in the Philippines. We're actually seeing a drop in out of pocket. So one, one, we're so there. There seems to be that uh, if we if government spends more money for health using tax revenues, using compulsory contributions, that might actually trigger further reduction in out of pocket so so now the challenge is kind of the next one please uh as, as, and uh and and we could see this with us when we start looking at the share of out of pocket and share of government spending so by 2020 uh so the government spending is now higher than out of pocket so we haven't seen that in years okay it's been quite a while i have i don't think i've seen that in the last 20 years and and now we're seeing out of pocket really now moving downwards to about 44.7. Government spending is up to 45. And this is a trend, of course, that we have seen in Indonesia. We have seen this in Thailand way back, where when they started mobilizing more government spending for health or for the UHC, you actually seen significant drops in out of pocket. By the way, you're also seeing this now in Vietnam. So so is the Philippines in the trend of decreasing out of pocket? And so we know it's not just more government money, but it's going to be the main intervention that you need. It also means you need to be more efficient in what you pay for. But uh, we will focus more on how we, how the government, how we, how the country should, in a sense, exploit the financing opportunities for UAT that have been opened up in recent reforms, in in recent laws and other uh, reforms. Next slide, please. So, uh, sorry, this is. 
Okay. It's just like the schematic diagram that you say. But there's, if there's one thing I want to highlight here, is that 9.6% is voluntary health. So this is private health insurance, uh, or HMOs, they're, they're different from each other, uh, or other corp, uh, company health services, right? So there's actually another significant chunk of money that's prepaid in the country, but it's actually going to this private sector uh, private uh, voluntary process, which unfortunately is not uh, does not really contribute to social solidarity. Um, it's it's not as bad as out of pocket, but uh, we, we'll discuss later how we, that can still be maximized by uh, in in uh, as a financing source for UHC. Next slide, please. So, what are the financing opportunities? And these are basically based on what the uh, 2019 UHC law have passed. Next slide. So, uh, so one is that, of course, the Philippines has, has been much commented on this, on how it has uh, coupled increasing uh, uh, excise tax levels, okay, for what they call sin products, right? Tobacco, including uh, vape products, inhaled tobacco, which is, I think, the Philippines among the first that actually tax that, alcoholic beverages and sweetened beverages, and then allocating, uh, sometimes we use the word earmark, but we, it's not a direct earmark as it's understood by fiscal experts where once you collect the tax, you actually transfer it to, uh, let's say, PHIC or DOH, but actually more like a soft earmark, some, some call it soft earmark, but it's actually more like an allocation uh, that's provided to the Depart Department of Health and PHIC and, pro and, pro and uh, it requires them to justify why they should get this money, but that money essentially is already allocated to them. And, uh, it, and it generally flows into uh, the government subsidy, funding the government subsidy for those non-contributory members to PHIC, and uh, a big chunk to the health facility enhancement program. There are other interventions supposed to finance much smaller one, but these, these are the two main uh, UHC uh, components that uh, the health taxes are supposed to pay. In addition to that, uh, lottery money, so PCSO, and gambling money from PAGPOR is actually also been allocated. Uh, and here the wording is quite interesting because it's not to fund subsidies like the, we talk about health taxes, but to improve PHIC benefits directly. Uh, similarly, with the recent government order, they're, they're also saying that this is uh, not a direct earmark, but an allocation. It also goes to the process of uh, some PHIC and DOH have to request for this, and this will be part of their budget. Now, what's the challenge here? Well, you know, this ha the, the, you need to, one, make sure you know these amounts, that this is tracked uh, and properly, uh, I, the, the money that's that's been collected here is tracked appropriately by health researchers. And this tracking will allow the timely releases because that's part of the challenge. You, the, you know you got the allocation, but if you don't know how much or that's not tracked in a timely manner, then you'll be able to ensure the timely releases and all. So the DOH actually have estimated this with their medium-term expenditure framework. Uh, this is the PAGCOR amount. Uh, how much they expect to get from PAGCOR and PCSO? They have also, sorry, I missed the slide there, uh, but they have also done this estimate for the health taxes. And we're actually expecting a big jump this year because this is uh, the 2020 excise tax reforms that increase the range would actually start kicking in. Uh, this year and next year. So the, the uh, 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 significant increase of health taxes are expected to be available for our, and al or allocated already to the Department of Health. So this is going, this, this uh, tracking this, uh, uh, monitoring this, uh, ensuring its timely releases, uh, uh, protecting this uh, allocation would be among the challenges, uh, would be among the things that the Department of Health or UHC advocates should be monitoring, studying, and uh, uh, yeah, next slide, please. So the second, of course, is uh, the traditional source of revenue for PHIC, which is the compulsory premiums. And here, the challenge really is, well, include, including making sure that the legislated increase in premium levels uh, are maintained, including the salary floor, salary ceiling. You really need to strengthen the tracking of the contributor members and, and the collection. And uh, one thing that has not happened is that the collaboration 
between um, similar agencies that similarly uh, get uh, contribution from Filipinos. You know, we haven't seen that uh, collaboration. So Pag-ibig, for example, uh, probably do a, do a better job of get collecting money from uh, the formal sector. Probably because people want to contribute there so they can do housing loans. But nonetheless, there's this collaboration between uh, Pag-ibig because the population that goes to Pag-ibig, that our members of Pag-ibig and PSI here are essentially the same. Unlike the SSS, which is more formal sector, and GSIS, Pag-ibig is probably more significant informal members. Uh, but so collaborating with these agencies uh, and sitting down and working together, cross-referencing or even using single portals, payment portals would be among those that you could actually use to maximize uh, financing, uh, to, uh, increasing your efficiency in collecting uh, the premium contribution, which is a major source, financing source for UHC. Next slide, please. So then, of course, then we have still the appropriations uh, that the DOH. So not the general appropriations that the DOH and PH uh, get is not just limited to the health taxes. Okay. So there's actually the appropriations for the last few years are actually much higher than whatever uh, allocated health taxes for UHC or health has happened. So here the challenge is, of course, uh, go back to how to strengthen DOH obligation disbursement. There is a uh, line item in DOH called MIPE, which is $22 billion, so, uh, and it's actually also described as uh, social health protection. And so there's a need to make sure this complement uh, with uh, whatever uh, financing that, that, that for PHIC, for HFF, the main uh, interventions of UHC that is being financed to the budget. Then, of course, you need to start doing, if you need to get more money over and above what you've been traditionally been getting to your budget, you need investment plans. And DOH have done a great job here, including the work, the Health Facility Development Plan, work led by Val and uh, uh, Ulep and his team, the Health Human Resource Plan, or next slide, please. Uh, or, so, sorry, so this just the, Bobby just shows that DOH has actually done a better job now in using the money that they have in their budget. Next slide, please. Or we're talking about uh, investment plans for NCDs or investment plans for TB elimination. Okay, for a lot of times it has been a business as usual approach in how uh, their budget has been uh, asked uh, from from Congress. And if and if there's nothing new, if there's nothing uh, that you're going to ask for, it's, it's difficult to get more budget money uh, to the usual GA process. So uh, DOH have already done these master plans. I think the challenge for them is how to craft this into investment plans and start using this to argue for more budgetary allocation to the GA. Next slide, please. So I want to talk. Then, of course, the next challenge is uh, LGUs. Okay. And so there are, the UHC law actually has a very interesting provision, which is uh, you, sorry, well, the, uh, the special health fund is supposed to be the recipient of all field health payments for LGU health facilities. So in a sense, it's, it's similar to the income retention that DOH have been having to special provision in the budget. So this creates sort of a virtuous cycle that uh, you get more money for health out of the PHIC payment uh, for LGUs and DOH hospitals and even user fees for DOH hospitals. And this expands the money, the financing that's available for UHC. So let's ensure that this virtual cycle either gets implemented, the special health fund law is not yet fully, is not yet implemented, or protected, which is the special provisions on the income retention of DOH, which is uh, an annual uh, special provision that's attached to what to the budget law of uh, of the year. Next slide, please. So for in addition to that, you need to mobilize LGU spending for health. Now. Right now, the provinces are actually doing a, a good job. Up to 24% of their total budget goes for health. Uh, cities and municipalities need to do a better job. But uh, how can you improve this? Well, tracking them is really something that we should keep on doing, and we have, and this is, comes from the uh, Department of Finance. But in addition to that, there should be explicit guidelines on what health services LGUs needs to be provided. Because how can you hold them accountable? or ask them or demand that they provide or finance health services if 
there's no explicit guidelines on what services they should be providing anyhow. So this is work, this policy work the DOH uh, can do, the executive can do, and to get the LGUs within the LGU code uh, on what they should be providing. You also, you could also, and this is something else people talk about, enable LGU health PPP projects. Next, next slide, please. So LGUs could actually have a lot of flexibility now in doing PPPs. And the moment you do PPPs, in effect, you uh, once you commit to that, you're committing really to a long-term spending of LGUs for health. Because when you go into PPP, there's always an obligation that the LGUs should be paying uh, a certain amount on an annual basis to the private partner. If you do this where you allow the private partner to charge you your fees, that's not consistent to THC. So the, the PPP should be designed in a manner that the LGU is committing to provide a, a sustained financing, paying for the services that will be provided to the private sector for its constituent. In addition to that, of course, the local government could actually provide LGUs the ability to provide incentives, tax exemptions, and other reliefs that will facilitate more investment by the private sector into health. And uh, next slide, and the final slide, next slide. Uh, and so finally, we also need to harness private spending for health. So we've already talked about the nearly 9% that flows to the health insurance and HMOs. So uh, this is money that is flowing. They're difficult for government to get, but it can be uh, regulated so that it actually complements whatever government is doing for UHC. There is a rule in the UHC law that 10% of private hospital beds should be no copayment. But I think I'm not sure what it's whether they call it no balance or no copayment. But essentially, once you have that, it makes the private sector sort of uh, subsidize services providing in 10% of their beds. And that's financing for UHC. And finally, you need to understand what the private health market is. Uh, if you look at the national health accounts, this is the where money for health actually goes, hospitals, providers of health services. But is there enough market analysis that's being done? Next slide, please. And this is some a work that's being done uh, with PIDS. We're basically, you know, when I start saw, seeing this, this was great because it actually gives us a, a better understanding of what private hospitals are. It's not just a listing of private hospitals about, you know, what are the, uh, the, the revenue generation capacity, what, what is the number of days that, that they could survive uh, with the lead receivables and all that. And more work on this, on the private sector, uh, should be done in a different market from the pharma, from the hospitals to the doctors, so that we have a better understanding uh, and government should have a better understanding on how to harness the private sector for UHC. Uh, thanks, all.